Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored and humbled to be part of this uh, convening. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everybody uh, here. Well, from the States. Um, let me let me try to answer those questions and the other sort of key terms that have, that have been presented to all the speakers um, in a sort of fluid way. So as you've mentioned, I'm a constitutional law professor. I teach uh, American constitutional law, but I'm also a scholar on the war on terror and a scholar on Islamophobia. Uh, so how I come to this issue and how I learned about uh, Imran Khan, uh, you know, is through the lens of two. Uh, you know, American constitutional legal principles, uh, which I identify as being selectively applied uh, and hypocritical, especially with the way they're deployed in this global war on terror. And second, uh, from the vantage point of Islamophobia and Imran Khan not only being a uh, champion president within Pakistan, but a champion president and a very unapolog unapologetic symbol uh, of uh, Muslim strength, globally speaking. So I'm here in the United States, as you all know. Um, you know, I'm, I study this, uh, you know, I study constitutional law and Islamophobia within the United States. And you might ask, you know, why is this Muslim American really keen on, um, you know, advocating on behalf of and why do I use my social media channels and publications to really, um, you know, stilt up the importance of Imran Khan? And let me let me lead with that. Number one, uh, Imran Khan com comes at a critical juncture when the United States, not only in the Arab world, but in the Muslim world, has been seeding leaders who are essentially puppets, right? Puppet leaders, proxies uh, who have been empowered and entrenched to expand American uh, you know, economic interests and geopolitical interests. We see this throughout the Arab world. Uh, we see this in other Muslim majority countries. Uh, and we've seen this not only recently, but for decades since the launch of the war on terror in the immediate aftermath of the 9-11 terror attacks. Now, Imran Khan is an antithesis of that, right? Not only by way of policy, not only by way of rhetoric, uh, but also by way of real practical action. Um, many of the speakers have mentioned how Imran Khan has been an advocate of uh, Kashmiri self-determination and independence. Um, now that we're in the thick of what's going on in Gaza and seeing Israel Israeli neocolonialism take on uh, genocidal forms in Gaza, we know that Imran Khan has always been a staunch and consistent supporter of Palestinian self-determination and the dignity of Palestinian people. We saw a couple of years ago when Russia invaded Ukraine and the entire Western world flanked around Ukraine and talked about principles of democracy, the rule of law, the importance of self-determination, the threat of colonialism, um, that Imran Khan was one of the first people to identify the Western hypocrisy and selective application of these constitutional principles. People also mentioned from uh, the vantage point of Islamophobia how Imran Khan was, you know, very much the first global leader to not only identify the importance of, um, you know, calling out Islamophobia as a bona fide form of bigotry that is unfolding on a global scale, which has been weaponized and has been intensified, um, you know, very nefariously by the by the American war on terror, but to, uh, for for Western organizations and transnational networks like the United Nations to formally identify a day of Islamophobia, and that had been enshrined on March 15th. So this is this architecture of achievement that Imran Khan has been able, been able to achieve as the lead, uh, as the executive of Pakistan, um, identifies the importance of him not only as a regional leader, but a global leader for Muslims, right? Somebody who is defiant, somebody who is courageous, and somebody who is principled to not only stand up for the dignity and the rights of Muslims globally speaking, whether it's in South Asia, whether it's in East Asia, uh, whether it's in the West, whether it's in the Middle East, I think that kind of universal application of Muslim dignity um, and, uh, you know, and, and Muslim importance in terms of humanity is something Imran Khan has definitely championed. But I think even more than that, as we sort of like juxtapose this, you know, really corrupt and uh, criminal incarceration of Imran Khan at this juncture with what's happening in Gaza, um, this moment when we juxtapose these two case studies identifies the importance of Imran Khan, right? Because one thing Imran Khan has always uh, lifted up uh, is to communicate to the West is, look, if the West stands for all of these uh, really vaunted principles that you claim to stand for, right? Uh, you stand for dignity. You, you stand for anti-racism. You stand for religious freedom. You stand for the rule of law. You stand for due process then you have to live by those standards, right? You have to live by those standards. So in many respects, Imran Khan foreshadowed, right? He sort of presented um, a early preface to what we're seeing happening in real time with regard to Gaza, which is finally the global South and global South leadership rising up to Western governments. 
Uh, we see that very vividly with South Africa bringing this case to the ICJ, um, you know, in very masterful fashion, presenting how the genocide uh, being advanced by the Israeli government not only meets what the global South defines as genocide, but more importantly, what Western legal definitions of criminal charges like genocide are, uh, demonstrating that the West has been really contradictory, right? They want to apply these constitutional principles uh, to Western governments and Western societies and, and white people with blonde hair and blue eyes in places like Ukraine, uh, you know, lifting up the fact that Ukrainians have the right to, um, you know, organize private militias to defend their homelands. That when Ukrainians throw Molotov cocktails at invading Russian tanks, that they're freedom fighters. Imran Khan was the first to say, hey, why isn't that the case when Kashmiris do the same thing? Why isn't that the case when Palestinians doing the same thing? Kashmiris like Ukrainians, Palestinians like Ukrainians are just defending their homeland. They're just defending their families. They're aspiring for self-determination. They're aspiring for a sovereign country. Imran Khan was the first um, global leader to say these things before South Africa brought a case against Israel to the ICJ, before N Namibia called out Germany's contradictory standpoint with regard to genocide and aligning itself with Israel to say, hey, no, Germany, you can't say that you stand for all these really important democratic principles, but in fact, you have committed genocide and are only aligning with Israel because you have guilt over the Holocaust. So in many respects, this moment we're seeing right now is a consequence of what's happening in Gaza, where the global South is rising up and finally calling out the hypocrisy, calling out the contradiction, calling out the selective application, um, you know, again, of all these constitutional aspirational principles that the West sees itself uh, to, to symbolize, that it never advances, that it never applies uh, to Muslim societies, Pakistan, Kashmir. Obviously, uh, Dr. Mubin Shah talked about how um, Indian Muslims have been, you know, oppressed considerably in that country and how the United States obviously has a vested interest in advancing, advancing Hindutva supremacy in that country um, as a strategy not only to, um, you know, function as a buffer to China, but to also weaken Pakistan. So in many respects, I think that ironically enough, being a constitutional law professor, uh, Imran Khan's case study, again, in two really important ways demonstrates how uh, he was very much a vanguard of the global South rising that we see right now. And second, uh, from a constitutional legal perspective, uh, somebody who was really pushing the West to say that if these are principles that you hold dear, if these are cornerstone to your legal systems, if these are central to your civilized societies, then why are you not applying due process? Why are you, why are you not, not applying human rights? Why are you not applying the rights to self-determination and sovereignty to oppress Muslim peoples? Right. And I think Imran Khan is key in identifying that. And that's why so Imran I, I have a question. Been. I have a question, which I said in the beginning. So uh, I, I agree with you. And but I wonder, I mean, from your pivotal position, I mean, position yeah. within the United States. And um, after all, what is the negotiated way? West is very powerful. The United States uh, uh, has a controlling influence on Pakistani key institutions. Mm -hmm. The United States has a lot of influence across the Middle East. Uh, Pakistani people stand for Imran Khan. What is the negotiated way forward in which the people of Pakistan uh, can can reclaim their dignity uh, and their sovereignty uh, and their right to have a government of their own choosing that mm -hmm. can also be at peace with the West? The issue is the interface between the West and the world of Islam. What is the way forward? Well, look, if I can be candid with you, I think this idea that a sort of even keel uh, symmetrical sort of like ne negotiation with the West is a myth, right? It's naive. The West believes in power. Uh, the West believes in imposing itself, uh, whether in the colonial uh, period or the neo-colonial period. So I think the way forward for uh, Pakistan and all global South countries is to unify along a collective block of global South countries who have experienced the same degree of um, subordination and the same degree of stigmatization from the West, right? I think it's naive to think that uh, the West is altruistic and has a good faith interest in instilling democracy in places like Pakistan or Palestine. They don't. They don't. They want to instill governments in these countries that are advancing their interest. So you can't negotiate with a power that is parasitic. You can't negotiate a with a power that sees you as a means to an end uh, versus, as, versus seeing you as an independent sovereign country. So the strategy moving forward is not negotiating or naively not negotiating with the West 
but it's to expand and entrench and, uh, and um, intensify solidarity with other global South countries. Very, very interesting perspective. Very, very interesting perspective, Khaled Badun, the how uh, Pakistan has not only to join with the other Muslim countries, but also to become a part of the global South to resist this domination. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Khaled Badun, the professor of law at the uh, Arizona State University. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank but now, you. 